In this video, uh, we look at um, some material from uh, section 5.5 in the Larson Calculus text, 10th edition. Um, it's about exponential functions with bases other than E. And here are some of the things that we'll talk about. We'll talk about how to relate A to the X to E to the X when our base A is not equal to E. We'll derive the change of base formula and then we'll state the derivative rules and the antiderivative rule for um, a to the x log base a of x and a to the x. Um, the, um, these we've stated before, but now we'll actually have some justification for it because we'll be supporting um, those rules with these um, derivations. And then there are lots of interesting applications. I'll probably do the applications in separate videos, um, but there are uh, compound interest applications, um, lots of logarithmic, or not logarithmic, logistic uh, growth applications, um, lots of real world applications related to exponential functions and the corresponding logarithmic functions. And um, so I think the easiest way to relate a to the x to e to the x is to use um, the inverse property of logarithms. Um, y equals log base a of x, is the inverse function of y equals a to the x. So these two functions undo each other. Um, if you look at the points on the graph of a to the x, um, if you flip the x and y, if you switch the x and y uh, coordinates, you'll have points on the graph of log base a of x. Um, so with that in mind, since these are inverse functions, if you compute log base a of a to the x, since they undo each other, you just get x back, provided that x is in the domain of a, excuse me, of a to the x, and this function is defined for all real numbers. So any x value will do. But then when we have um, a raised to the log base a of x power, those undo each other. So we get x back, but here x has to be in the domain of the logarithm. Since the range of a to the x is zero to infinity, um, the um, domain of the logarithm is zero to infinity. So here our x value has to be in the domain of log base a of x, which is zero to infinity. So graphically what you're talking about is um, a to the x, which looks roughly like that. If a is greater than zero, it's increasing, or excuse me, if a is greater than one, it's increasing. When uh, we substitute x equals zero here, we get a to the zero, which is one. And then when x is equal to one, y is equal to a. Now, when we graph the inverse function, we switch um, that x, those x, y pairs. Since x equals 0, y equals 1 is on this graph. x equals 1, y equals 0 is on the inverse function graph. And then since x equals 1, um, y equals a is on this graph. Um, x equals a, y equals 1 is on the inverse graph. So we'll have this. And basically they, they look like that. And of, of course this is again where y equals a to the x and a is greater than one. If a is less than one, then we're it's a fraction raised to the x, and rather than increasing, it decreases. It goes the other way. There's some symmetry on the line y equals x. So this point uh, 1a corresponds to this point a1. This point, um, 0, 1 corresponds to this point, um, uh, 1, 0. And because of that, because um, having A, B on this graph corresponds to having B, A on this graph, um, we have that symmetry across the line Y equals um, X. Um, so knowing this um, and using this um, and knowing that this applies to all bases, it also applies to um, E to the X. Uh, so E to the natural log of X is X. Um, as long as x is positive, so that x is in the domain of that natural log of x, 
And similarly, a natural log of e to the x is x. But here, um, x can be any number, any real number, because e to the x is well-defined for all real numbers. If we look at these graphs, we can see that the domain of a to the x is negative infinity to infinity, and that the range of log base a of x is also negative infinity to infinity. So our y values go from negative infinity to infinity. So it's all real numbers. And the range of a to the x, um, that is 0 to infinity here. That becomes the domain of log base a of x when we switch the rules of x and y. So we have 0 to infinity as the range of this function, which is the domain of that function. And so these, these functions undo each other. With that in mind, we can relate a to the x to e to the x relatively simply. I know e um, is, or e uh, raised to the logarithm of a to the x is a to the x, um, just by definition, because those two undo each other. Now, I have a log property that we discussed in a previous lesson. If we have a natural log of a to the n, we can bring that power out front. So this is n times natural log of a. When I see that exponent x here, I can bring that out front. This is going to be e to the x times natural log of a. Now, a is just a constant. So this is e to the x times natural log of a. Or you, this could be like a constant times x. Or you, you can think of this as a constant times x in that exponential function. Um, so this is a to the x, which is equal to this. And so this is an identity that we'll use. This tells us how a to the x and e to the x are related. And with that relationship, we can take the derivative of a to the x, or we can compute the derivative of a to the x relatively simply because we already have a rule for e to the x the derivative of a to the x with respect to x is the derivative with respect to x of this e raised to the x times natural log of a. And that's going to require the chain rule. We've got an inside function here. The derivative of e to some power is e to that power. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inside by the chain rule. I'm going to write that natural log of a first. But remember, um, natural log of a is just a constant. Because a is a constant, natural log of a is just a, a value. Um, when I have uh, the derivative with respect to x of this constant times x, I just get the constant. So when we simplify, we've got natural log of a times uh, this expression. But that expression is a to the x. Because you can bring that x inside. And the e and the natural log undo each other. And you just end up with a natural log of a times um, a to the x from here. OK, so that's our derivation. The derivative of a to the x is a to the x times natural log of a. If the base happens to be e, um, we see that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x times natural log of e. And natural log of e is just 1. But you can ask yourself, well, e to what power? Or Whenever you um, evaluate a logarithm, you can say e to what power is e, and it's always going to be the uh, first power. Um, it's provided that you guys don't understand how to evaluate logarithms, so we could review that real quick. And this is a pre-calc review. If someone asks you for the log base 5 of, let's say, um, 125, the way I answer that is sort of looking for an exponent and an exponential um, expression. Say log base 5 of 125 um, it, uh, corresponds to the answer to this question. I say to myself, 5 to what power is 125? Whatever that power is, is the answer for that logarithm. You say, well, 5 to the third is 125. 5 times 5 is 25. Times 5 again is 125. 
So log base 5 of 125 is 3. So when you see natural log of E, you say, okay, well, what is that? You're saying to yourself, well, with a natural log, the implied base is E, right? So that's never written there, but it's implied that that's E. So we're just saying E to what power is E? We say E to the first power. You'd be right. And then we get a one right there. Now here's another example. Say you've got log base two of a one sixteen. So then you say, okay, well, two to what power is one sixteen? Well, I can factor that 16, right? 16 is four times four, and four is two times two, so that's two times two times two times two. So this is one divided by two to the fourth, and we know that one divided by two to the fourth is two to the negative fourth. So you say two to what power is two to the negative fourth? The negative fourth power. So this is actually equal to negative four. So you're just, it's constantly asking a question. So if you have log base a of x, it's going to equal some number. And you're saying a to what power is x? The answer to that question goes there and there. So you say log base 5 of 125, 5 to what power is 125, 5 to the third is 125. Natural log of E, say E to what power is E, E to the first power. Um, not a log base 2 of 116, 2 to what power is 116? It's 2 to the negative 4, because that's 1 divided by 2 to the 4th, and 2 to the 4th is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. So 2 times 2 is 8, times 2 again is 8. Or, or 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 again is 8, and then if you multiply by 2 a fourth time, you get that 16 in the denominator. Um, so that's what I was thinking about when I was I was thinking about applying this rule to um, e to the x. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x times natural log of e, but e to the first power is e, so this is just a 1 for e to the x. So with the logarithm of base e, the derivative and the function itself are the same. They're exactly the same. Um, if the base is anything other than e, um, if it's a, um, then we um, multiply uh, by this extra factor of natural log of a. And the reason we can multiply, or the reason we should multiply by that natural log of a is that a to the x is actually um, e uh, raised to the natural log of a to the x power because the e and the natural log undo each other. When you bring that exponent out front using one of our log properties, we can just use the chain rule to take the derivative. So you have the derivative of the outside, which is the same expression, times the derivative of the inside, and that's just a constant times x, so the derivative is a constant, and we get this rule. Okay, so we've got that. We know what the derivative of a to the x is now. Um, before, I just gave you the rule. I had you memorize it. Nope. But now we actually know where it comes from. So let's say somebody asks you for the derivative of 3 to the x. It's just going to be natural log of 3 times 3 to the x. That's the same function, but you just multiply by the natural log of the base. Super simple. Okay. Now, um, with that um, identity that we just derived, we can derive the change of base formula as well. So let's look at that. Let's say we've got log base a of x equals y. Well, that is equivalent to saying um, that uh, a to the y power is equal to x. So I'm saying a to this power is that value. Okay, okay well, but what is a to the y? Well, a to the y can be written in terms of e in the natural log as e to the natural log of a to the y. That equals x because the e and the log undo each other, and we just end up with that a to the y, right? And then we have that log property that if you have log of a to some power, we can bring that power out front. And we, we derive that using our product rule for logarithms. Log of a times b is log of a plus log of b. If you have log of a times a, you end up with log of a plus log of a, so you end up with two of them. Or if you have log of a times a times a, you end up with 
log of a plus log of a plus log of a, so you end up with three of them. So whatever that exponent is, you end up with three copies of that and you add them together and that's why the exponent can come out front. So you say, okay, well, if I've got that, um, this uh, e to the natural log of a to the y can be rewritten with the y in front of the um, log base a. You might say, okay, well, why would I do that? And the reason is because we're trying to derive another way to come up with this log base a of x. And this is called the change of base formula. So I bring my y out front. Natural log of y is, or natural log of a is just a constant. Y is actually the log base a of x. And this is equal to x. And I want to uh, solve for y. So I say, okay, I'm trying to get rid of this e. How do I get rid of the e? I'm going to use inverse functions. We'll take the, the natural log of both sides. And so on the left-hand side, the log and the exponential undo each other, and we just end up with y times natural log of a. On the right-hand side, we, get not, we have natural log of x. And then we can divide both sides by natural log of a. And we see that y, which is a log base a of x, can be rewritten as natural log of x divided by natural log of a. So whatever you are um, taking the logarithm of, that goes in the numerator. And then whatever the base is, you take the log of that and you put that in the denominator. But this will allow you to change from log base two of x to log base e of x. And you could have done the same thing using the base 10 if you wanted to. Sometimes a, an alternate form of this is log base 10 of x. Uh, divided by log base a of x. But this is called the change of base formula. I have a tendency to use or think about this expression in terms of this one when I take derivatives. Um, so um, that's the formula. Now we know that this can be rewritten this way. And now we know where um, this change of base formula comes from. Just comes from using that inverse property of the exponential and the logarithm combined with this logarithmic property. Um, to solve for this in terms of natural log of x and natural log of a. So we've got that. And now that we have the change of base formula, we can uh, take the uh, derivative of the log base a of x, we can derive a rule for that. Now, this is another one that I just stated for you. <laughs> uh, but uh, we can uh, derive this uh, rule for the derivative of log base a of x using our change of base formula with the natural log of x and our knowledge of the derivative of natural log of x. Natural log of a is just a constant. So I can factor out that one divided by natural log of a and then multiply by the derivative of natural log of x. And that derivative of natural log of x is just one over x. So we end up with uh, one divided by natural log of a times one divided by x is one divided by natural log of a times x. And so that is our formula for the derivative of log base a of x. And it makes sense. You just end up with that extra natural log of a in the denominator. The derivative of natural log of x is one over x. So with the natural log base a of x, we just it looks almost identical to the derivative of this guy, but we just end up with this extra natural log of a factor. So super simple example. Let's say somebody wants you to find the derivative of log base two of x. Well, just it's going to be 1 divided by natural log of 2 times x. It's that simple. It really is that simple. <laughs> and the reason that that's the case is because we're just taking natural log of x. Its derivative is 1 over x, and then we divide by that natural log of 2. And so we get that. Uh, now, there is another way to derive this formula. We can derive this formula using implicit differentiation. Um, and our log properties. Let's say we know that log base a of x is equal to y, and we're trying to find the derivative of log base a of x with respect to x. And we don't know the derivative yet. If we don't know the derivative yet, we can say, well, I don't know much about log base a of x is derivative, but I know something about exponential functions. I know something about a to the y. So I can say a to this power is equal to a to that power. 
and the exponential uh, function with base A and the logarithmic function with base A, they undo each other because they're inverses. So when they undo each other, you end up with this X equals A to the Y, where Y is the function that you're trying to take the derivative of. So if you want, you can write that as Y of X, um, just to make it a little bit more explicit. Now, when we take the derivative of both sides, we're going to take the derivative um, using implicit differentiation, so remembering that that y is a function of x. So we have the derivative with respect to x of x equals the derivative with respect to x of a to the y. We say, well, what's the derivative of x with respect to x? It's just 1. And then what's the derivative of a to the y with respect to x? Well, and the derivative of a to some power is a to that power. Yeah times the derivative of the inside by the chain rule um, times uh, natural log of a, because our derivative of a to the x is a to the x times the natural log of the base. So we've got that there. Um, and now we're trying to uh, solve for dy dx. I'm going to rewrite that in a slightly different way. Uh, dy dx equals, we have 1 on this side, divided by natural log of a, times a to the y of x. And you say, well, what is a to the y of x? Well, a to the y of x was x. Um, a to the y equals x because log base a of x is equal to y. So this is x. So we end up with natural log of a times x in that denominator is the derivative with respect of y with respect to x, where y was um, log base a of x. So we have just derived the formula, the derivative with respect to x of log base a of x is 1 divided by natural log of a times x. So we can derive it uh, using um, our inverse properties and implicit differentiation, or we can derive the formula using our change of base formula and just um, factoring out that constant and multiplying by the derivative of natural log of x. But we see that we get the same answer either way. We get 1 divided by natural log of a times x in either case. Um, so that's our that's our new rule. That's actually not a new rule. It's a, a rule that we've discussed before, but now we actually have a, a derivation. I think we may have done this derivation before, but we didn't do this derivation last time because we hadn't derived that change of base formula. Okay, and now since we've got a derivative formula for a to the x, we also might like to have an antiderivative formula for a to the x. It's actually relatively simple. I lost that page. Oh, there it is. I didn't put it in a box. The derivative with respect to x of a to the x is natural log of a times a to the x. So that's my rule. So when I take the derivative of this, I multiply by a natural log of a. Can anybody guess what the antiderivative is? I'm trying to undo that operation. We just divide by a natural log of a. Because we're doing this backwards. The derivative of a to the x is a to the x, the exact same function, times this natural log of a. And if I want to go from this side to this side, um, I have to divide instead. So we'll have 1 divided by natural log of a times a to the x plus c is our antiderivative rule for a to the x. And you can check your answer if you want to by taking the derivative with respect to x of 1 divided by natural log of a times a to the x plus c. Uh, when we take the derivative of this, we've got a constant times a to the x, so we just write down our constant. And then you multiply by the derivative of a to the x. Well, the derivative of a to the x is natural log of a times a to the x, and the derivative of c is 0. Because we multiplied by this natural log of a when we took the derivative, and we divided by the natural log of a when we took the antiderivative, those reduce, and we just end up with a to the x, which is our original integrand, which is what we want. Um, the derivative of the antiderivative should be the original function, and it is. Um, so we've got... Uh, this antiderivative rule, the two new derivative rules, we did the derivation for the um, change of base formula. And now we know that because of this property of exponentials, um, e to the natural log of something is always that something. Um, this a to the x can be written in terms of e in this way. So we just use that inverse property of 
uh, e to the x and natural log of x, and then the log property where we can bring that x out front. Um, so these guys are the same. Um, with that in mind, we're able to derive all of these formulas. Um, okay, so we've got derivative rules. We've got antiderivative rules. We have some justification for those rules. Um, now we might want to just solve some problems. So let, let's um, differentiate some functions here. Uh, let's, this is a problem 39 in this section. Actually, I think I will give you the problem numbers this time. Um, we've got um, f of x equals 5 uh, raised to the uh, negative 4x. You say, okay, well, what's the derivative of that? Well, um, there are a couple of ways we can look at it, uh, but I would prefer to just look at it as it's written, and we'll just use the chain rule. Because we don't just have a 5 to the x, and we've got a 5 to the negative 4x. So this is our function that's inside that 5 to the x function, and that 5 to the x function is on the outside. So when we take the derivative, say, OK, how do I compute the derivative of a to the x? Well, the derivative of a to the x is a, which in our case is 5, time, evaluated at the inside function. So you just put it back inside, times the derivative of the inside by the chain rule. And I forgot to multiply by my natural log of the five. Uh, so you multiply by natural log of the base. The derivative of an exponential is the exact same exponential times the log of the base. And then if there's an inside function, times the derivative of the inside by the chain rule. And the derivative of the inside is negative four. So we have negative four natural log of five. That's just a constant. And it's multiplying this five times, uh, or five raised to the negative four x power. Um, so that's just a number um, times this function. Um, and this uh, function is giving us the slope of the original function here. So we could graph both of those. We could use this function to find rates of change of this function if we wanted to. And if we had a particular x value in mind, like x equals 0 or something like that, we could find the equation of the tangent line. So remember, whenever you're computing a derivative, you're finding a slope. You're finding a rate of change of that function. Um, just to, to give us some sense of, of that, say, okay, well, what does 5 uh, raised to the negative 4x look, look like? Well, if we evaluate this at x equals 0, we have 5 to the 0, which is 1. And if we evaluate at x equals negative 1, we'll have 5 to the negative 4 um, times negative 1, so 5 to the 4th. So that's 5 times 5 times 5 times 5. What's uh, 125 times 5? It's going to be 500 plus another an extra 125. So it's going to be 625. So this is clearly not scale. But um, at x equals negative 1, the function value is 625. And at x equals positive 1, we're going to have one, um, 5 to the negative 4 times 1. Um, so I just did sort of the simple ones first. Oops. This is 5 to the 0, which is 1. I said at negative 1, we get 5 to the negative 4 times negative 1, which is 5 to the 4th, which is 625. And then if we evaluate at x equals 1, we have 5 to the negative 4th. So that's 1 divided by 5 to the 4th, and 5 to the 4th was 625. So this is actually 1 divided by 625. So it's very, very, very small. Okay, so this is not to scale at all. But we see that because we have that negative exponent, it's an exponential function, has that same basic shape, but instead of increasing from left to right, it's decreasing. And if you're saying, hmm, I thought that the graphs only looked like that when the base was a fraction, and you'd be right, we can rewrite that 5, f of x equals 5 to the negative 4x as 1 divided by 5 to the 4x using that exponent property that we use all the time. And that is the same thing as 1 over 5 all raised to the 4x. And because if I have 1 raised to the 4x, I just get 1. And then 5 to the 4x is what we get in the denominator. Um, so if our base is a fraction, if our base is a fraction between 0 and 1, and we raise it to um, a power that um, doesn't have that negative sign, 
Um, so as X goes to negative infinity, if as X goes to negative infinity, um, well, anyway, I wasn't going to say something about X going to negative infinity and X going to positive infinity. Um, but basically, it's it looks it looks like a it's positive. This actually has just a negative sign there. So when I see that negative sign, it sort of flips everything. Uh, but anyway, um, if you've got just a one fifth to the x, it's going to look like that. One fifth to the four x, it looks like that as well. It's just you're raising it to the fourth power before you raise it to the x power. Uh, so you make it really small first, and then you raise it to the x power. So it gets it gets even smaller over here on the right, and it gets even larger over here on the left because of that four. Say okay, well, what does that have to or what does that mean for this um, this function, the derivative? Well, the derivative is always negative. A five to the negative four x is always a positive val value. All the y values on this graph are positive. What we can see as we move from left to right, the graph is going down. So anywhere I draw my tangent line, I'm going to have a slope that is, has a negative value. So if I want to evaluate the slope at x equals zero, I've got negative four times natural log of five times five to the zero, which is one. That's the slope of our tangent line. And the equation of the tangent line is y equals the y value here at x equals 0, y is equal to 1, plus the slope, which is negative 4 natural log of 5, times x minus 0. Subtracting 0 doesn't do anything. Um, so y equals neg or 1 minus uh, 4 times natural log of 5 times x is the equation of the tangent line here. And I actually don't know what that slope looks like, but roughly my graph is going to look like that. Uh, uh. Now, natural log of 5 um, is the answer to the question, e to what power is 5? Now, e is about 2.7-ish, right? Um, so... Uh, and if I took 2.7 and I square it, that's like taking three and squaring it. That, that would be nine, right? Uh, so this, uh, this number, uh, natural log of five, has to be somewhere between um, uh, one and two uh, because the exponent is somewhere between, because that five is uh, between e, which is about 2.7, and nine. Um, so I've got uh, this number that's between one and two, and then I multiply it by negative four. That means the slope is somewhere between uh, negative four and negative eight. And it, the graph passes through the point x equals zero, y equals one. So we get a graph that roughly looks like that. And so we've taken the derivative. I'm just using that derivative rule for a to the x. It's a to the x times natural log of a. And then if you've got some function inside other than an x, uh, you have to multiply by the derivative of the inside by the chain rule. And then with that piece of information, you can find slopes. And we can see here that um, all the slopes are negative. And we can see from the uh, definition of f prime that all the slopes are negative as well because uh, exponentials are always positive and we're just taking this negative number and multiplying it by a positive number and so we get a negative slope all the time. All right, so that is our first example of how to take a derivative of an a to the f of x power. Here's another one. Let's say we've got g of t equals uh, t squared times 2 to the negative t. That, that requires the uh, product rule. So here's my first function, and there's my second. When we take the derivative of that product, we get the derivative of the first times the second undifferentiated plus the derivative of the second, times the first, undifferentiated. And that's a two to the first times a two to the negative t. Um, we can add the exponents. When you have x to some power times x to a different power, you add the exponents. And that rule still holds even if the base happens to be a number. So we have two to the first times two to the negative t going to be 2 to the 1 minus t. That's multiplying t. 
And then we're adding uh, t squared times the derivative of two to the uh, negative t power. And the derivative of two to some power is natural log of two times two to that power times the derivative of the inside by the chain rule. And the derivative of the inside in this case is just a negative one. So our g prime is two times a raised to the one minus t times t minus, uh, we've got a t squared times natural log of two times t to the, uh, or two to the negative t power. Okay, okay that's g prime. Uh, if you're trying to find critical points, if you wanted to graph this function, you might say, well, when is g prime equal to zero? Uh, well, if I'm trying to find the values or the x or t values, excuse me, where g prime is equal to zero, I would probably want to um, write this in a different way. I probably wanted to leave that factored the way it was before. Instead of combining that two to the first and the two to the negative t, it probably should have just left the two to the negative t factor here and here. Um, so I think I'll do that again. This was 2t times uh, 2 to the negative t. And then we've got minus t squared times natural log of 2 times 2 to the negative t. And if I want to factor this and set it equal to 0 so that I can find the critical numbers of the function and then graph it, I look at this uh, term and this term, and I see if they have anything in common. Well, if they both have that 2 to the negative t in common here and here. So I'll factor that out. Say, what else do they have in common? Well, this one has a t, and that one has a t squared. So I can factor out one of the t's. I've got one of those and just one of these. And you say, OK, if I factor out the 2 to the negative t and the t, then what's left? 2 to the negative t times t times what will give me this first term? Just the extra 2. So that's what's missing there. And here I say 2 to the negative t times t times what will give me the second term. I already have that. I need the negative sign, so I'll write that down. I need the natural log of 2, so I'll write that down. And then we actually have an extra factor of t. I've only factored out one of them, so I'll have a t here. So g prime is equal to this, and uh, that function is equal to 0 when either this is 0 or this is 0 or this is 0. Um, so this would be finding the critical points of g. Um, And we might do that because we want to determine relative extrema of G. And we might do that uh, because we uh, want to graph G as well. So we compute G prime, set G prime equal to zero, and solve for T. So we have two to the negative T equals zero, or T equals zero, or uh, 2 minus natural log of 2 times t equals 0. Now, I hope you look at that and say that could, that'll could that never happen. Uh, t to, or 2 to the negative t is always positive. If we look at the graph, it looks like this. If we wanted to, we could use exponent properties to rewrite that. That is actually 1 divided by 2, uh, two to the t, or 1 half raised to the t power. As soon as I see it as 1 half raised to the t power where my base is some number between 0 and 1, I know it's decreasing, so it looks like that. Notice that the y value is never 0, so that's not going to happen. Um, we've got t equals 0, so that's one of our critical numbers. And then with this one, you can solve for t by adding this two, our natural log of 2t times natural log of 2 times t to both sides, and then dividing both sides by natural log of 2. And so that's a critical value as well. So you've got two critical values, two divided by natural log of two and zero. And those are potential um, locations for relative extrema. Now, if we want to determine whether t equals zero and t equals two divided by natural log of two correspond to relative extrema, we can make a sign chart for g prime and um, see if the sign of g prime changes at uh, this value or this value. So we'll do that. Now natural log of two is greater than natural log of one, and natural log of or the natural log graph looks like this. So when x is equal to one, uh, y is equal to zero because e to the zero power is one, and 
the logarithm is positive to the right of one and negative between zero and one. Um, other x values are not in the domain of the function. So when I see natural log of two, I'm thinking to myself, is it positive or negative? It's positive because uh, two is over here to the right of one. I don't know what the value is, but I know that it's gonna be um, greater than zero. I mean, I actually say, if I wanted to sort of calculate for myself, I'd say e to what power is two? It's gonna be some number that's a little bit less than, um, well, e to what power is two? It's gonna be a little bit less than one. So it's gonna be a fraction. It's between zero and one, um, but it's positive. So I've got two divided by that positive fraction. So we're gonna have a t value that is slightly greater than two. Um, because we're taking two and dividing by a fraction, which is going to make it larger. Um, but the point is that it's, it's a positive number. So it's going to be to the right of zero. And we're interested in the sine of g prime, which is the product of uh, two to the negative t and t and two minus natural log of two times t. Now the two to the negative t is always positive. As the graph looks like that, the y values are always positive on that graph. Now t is negative uh, from negative infinity to zero, and it's positive to the right of zero. And then you, then you say to yourself, well, what does that look like? Well, natural log of two is a positive number. So this graph is going to look roughly like this. When t equals zero, y equals two. And then it, the graph has a slope of negative natural log of two. Then you say, okay, what is that? Well, what does the graph look like? I have that t on the next page. It's natural log of two times t, right? Um, well, uh, well the, if this is roughly what it looks like, we know that it equals zero at two divided by natural log of two. Um, we know that's true. Um, but then when we look at the y values on the graph, uh, we can use those to um, add our um, signs to our sign chart. can see that the y values are positive on that line uh, to the left of uh, two divided by natural log of two. So you've got a positive number there and there. And then when t is greater than two divided by natural log of two, our y values are negative. We can do that. Now, sometimes we just pick test values on those intervals. But I find it's easier if I can just graph it. And we can graph that line if we know the sine of the natural log of two. We know the sine of the natural log of two because we understand the signs of uh, the natural log of x. Natural log is positive to the right of one and natural log is negative between zero and one. So g prime is a positive times a negative times a positive, which makes it negative on that interval and positive times a positive times a positive on that interval, so it's positive. And then g prime is a positive times a positive times a negative, which makes that negative. So that means, or that tells us that the original function g is decreasing on this interval and increasing on this interval. And we know that it has a zero slope when t equals zero. So if it goes from decreasing to having a zero slope to increasing, we must have a relative min there at zero. And then at this location, with the function's increasing to the left at that point, and then it has a zero slope at the top, and then it's um, decreasing to the right of that point. Since it goes from increasing to having a zero slope to decreasing, um, that uh, this t value corresponds to a relative maximum. Um, so that is uh, the first derivative test. We know that a g of zero, which is just zero squared times two times, or two raised to the opposite of zero, which is just zero. Two to the zero is one. Um, that's gonna give us a g value of zero. So g of zero is zero, that's a relative min of the function. We know that g evaluated at two divided by natural log of two is two divided by natural log of two. That's our t value and then we're squaring it. And then we're multiplying by two raised to the two divided by natural log of two power, um, but then it was a negative t. So that's our t value we need to multiply by negative one. And I'd say, okay, well, how do I simplify that? Well, um, that negative two can be rewritten in terms of um, the exponent, exponential function, um, with the base e. 
And then once I have this a negative two in the numerator in terms of the natural log, I can use my change of base formula to write that quotient um, with the log base two. So um, that negative two, I can think of as natural log of e to the negative two, because you say to yourself, well, what is, um, or when you, you ask yourself how to evaluate this, you say e to what power is e to the negative two? It's the negative two power. E to the negative two is e to the negative two, of course. So that numerator can be written as e, or excuse me, uh, or this, this ex exponential factor can be written as two times um, this numerator divided by the denominator, and the numerator is natural log of e to the negative two, and then the denominator is natural log of two. And then uh, according to our change of base formula, the natural log of e to the negative two divided by the natural log of two is actually log base two of e to the negative two power. Um, this is the this goes into your base, and then that is what you're taking the logarithm of from our change of base formula. And you say, well, why would I ever want to write it like that? Well, we'd want to write it like that so that we would have uh, something that simplifies here. Uh, if I, I square this fraction, I have a four in the numerator and natural log of two in the denominator. And then this is two raised to the log base two of e to the negative two power. And two raised to the log base two of anything is just whatever's inside because those are inverse functions, they undo each other. So we end up with four divided by natural log of two squared times e to the negative two. Or if you prefer, you can call that four divided by natural log of two squared times e squared. Or you can call that natural log of two times e quantity squared. Either way, um, that is a, our function value, simplified as much as possible. And we say, okay, according to the first derivative test, since the function goes from increasing to having a zero slope to decreasing, this is a relative maxima. Now, do I know what that value is? No, I really don't. Uh, natural log of two is some fraction. It's between zero and one. I'm squaring that and I'm multiplying by that 2.7-ish squared. And so I've got this, this fraction squared, so it's even smaller. And then um, I'm multiplying by that 2.7 squared, um, which is somewhere uh, between uh, four and uh, nine, right? And so I'm taking some number between four and nine, I'm multiplying it by a fraction, and then I'm taking four and I'm dividing by that. Uh, I think this is going to be less than one, but I might, I'm might i not really sure. I'll need to use a calculator to get a decimal approximation. Uh, but we know that that is a relative maximum. Okay, so we know that. And you say, okay, well, what about um, concavity? What about the second derivative? Well, we can compute the se second derivative. This is the derivative with respect to t of this. This is a, our factored form, but maybe we'll use this form instead. We'll have to use the product rule for this derivative and the product rule for this derivative and then the chain rule for the derivatives of the exponential functions. So we have two to the one minus t times t minus uh, t squared times natural log of two, which is just a constant, times two to the negative t. When I take the derivative of this first expression, I need to use the product rule. Here's my first function and there's my second function. Now, according to the product rule, the derivative of a product is the derivative of the first times the second undifferentiated. So you just multiply by a t. And then we add the derivative of the second. Derivative of t is just one times the first undifferentiated. And then I've got a constant times a t squared times a two, two to the negative t. So I think I'll factor out that constant. So I'm factoring out the negative natural log of two. And then I'll say, I'm um, gonna multiply that by the derivative of this product, t squared times two to the negative t. And this will require the product rule. So this will be our first function and this will be our second function. And we'll use the product rule for that. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Let's compute this derivative here. So I have the derivative of two to some power. Well, according to our new rule for the derivative of a to the uh, t power, 
and the derivative of a to the t is natural log of a times a to the t. Uh, but instead of a t, I've got a, a 1 minus t inside. So we're using the chain rule. So when we take the derivative of this, a is 2. So we get natural log of a, which is 2, times 2 raised to that power. So you put the inside function back inside. And then you multiply by the derivative of the inside by the chain rule. The derivative of 1 minus t is negative 1. And we're taking that, we're multiplying it by t. That t is still there. And then we have this 1 times 2 to the 1 minus t. We'll just leave that alone. And then we have this negative natural log of 2. And we're open some big parentheses because you're taking a derivative of a product here. It's going to have two terms, and both of them need to be multiplied by that negative natural log of 2. We take the derivative of this. We say the derivative of a product is the derivative of the first, which in this case is 2t, uh, times the second, undifferentiated plus the derivative of the second. Now the derivative of the second is the derivative of a to a function of t. The derivative of a to a function of t is natural log of a, in this case a is two, times a to that function of t power. So you leave the exponential alone. It's exactly the same as it was before. But then you multiply by the derivative of the inside by the chain rule. And the derivative of the inside is negative one. This is all the derivative of the second. Don't forget to multiply by that first function, which was t squared. So that's what we've got. A lot of terms, isn't it? <laughs> uh, let's simplify. We've got natural log of 2 times a negative 1. So I'll bring that, I'll factor that out. Times t times a 2 uh, raised to the 1 minus t plus 2 raised to the 1 minus t. And then if we distribute here, we've got negative natural log of 2. This 2 to the first times 2 to the negative t, if we add the exponents, that's going to be, well, we have that t. I'll, I'll write that first. And then we'll have 2 to the 1 minus t there as well. And then if I distribute this negative natural log of 2 here, I have negative natural log of 2 times an actual, another negative natural log of 2. That's going to give me a positive natural log of 2 uh, quantity squared. And then I've got a t squared and a 2 to the negative t power. OK. Now, one thing I notice is I've got a 2 to the t minus 1, 2 to the t minus 1, 2 to the, I said t minus 1, 2 to the 1 minus t, 2 to the 1 minus t, a 2 to the 1 minus t. And this last one's just a 2 to the minus t. This one doesn't have that extra factor of 2 that these others do. So if you want to, you could write this as 2 times 2 to the negative t um, for all of those. Or you could take this one and uh, simplify it in some way. Like I'd like to have a 2 to the 1 minus t here, so I'll multiply by 2. You say, you can't just multiply by 2. You're right, you can't just multiply by 2. That's legal. I can multiply by that t to the first, or 2 to the first, as long as I also divide by 2. Um, then I'm just multiplying that term by a well-chosen one. And you say, okay, if we multiply by a well-chosen one, when we multiply those two numerators together, we get a 2 to the 1 minus t, and then I'll have a common factor of 2 to the 1 minus t in all of these. So you say, okay, uh, what else do these terms all have in common? Um, well, I've got a negative natural log of 2 here and a negative natural log of 2 here. Those, those terms are actually the same. I've got a negative uh, natural log of 2 times t times 2 to the 1 minus t. And then I've got another one that's just like it. So that's negative 2 natural log of 2 times t times 2 to the 1 minus t. And then from this piece, I've got a 2 to the 1 minus t. And then from this part, we've got a natural log of 2 squared times t times a 1 half times a 2 to the 1 minus t. All right, so um, with this, uh, we can factor out that 2 to the 1 minus t from this term, this term, and this term. A little bit tedious. That's OK. It'll allow us to graph the function when we're done, which is kind of cool. So 2 to the 1 minus t. And then I look at 
this term and then this term and then this term. And I see, is there anything else that they all have in common? Say no, because this middle term is just the two to the one minus T. So when I factor that out from this one, I'm just gonna have a one there. So um, there's not really much I can do to, um, uh, not, nothing else that I can factor out from all the terms. So I say to myself, two to the one minus T times what gives me this first expression. And I'm looking at this expression and then this one and then this one. And you say, how, how am I identifying those expressions? They're whatever we're adding and subtracting from each other. So I'm looking for like a product of things and then I'm adding this next thing and I'm adding this next thing. So I'm focused on this term and this term and this term. It's not like a traditional term, like in a polynomial. In a polynomial, you have a constant times x to some power. We're talking about polynomials in one variable. Um, but it's similar to that in the sense that we're looking for something that this expression, this expression, and this expression have in common. And um, we're factoring something out. And we could distribute this back through those three expressions, and we could get the original uh, g double prime. So you say to yourself, uh, 2 to the 1 minus t times what gives us this first expression? It's negative 2, natural log of 2 times t. And then 2 to the 1 minus t gives us this expression. Or 2 to the 1 minus t times what gives us this expression? It's just a 1. And then 2 to the 1 minus t times what gives us this one? Well, we've got a 1 half and natural log of 2 squared and a t. And it's a little bit, uh, it looks a little bit complicated because of those natural log of 2s. Uh, but natural log of 2 is just a number, some number between 0 and 1. It's a positive number. Um, this is actually just a constant times t, and this is a different constant times t, so I can add those together if I want to. This is uh, 2 to the 1 minus t times 1 half natural log of 2 squared minus 2 natural log of 2. All of that is multiplied by t, and then we're adding 1 to that. I guess we probably should use some curly brackets on these guys. So you say, okay, when is g double prime equal to 0? Well, g double prime equals 0 when this factor equals 0 or when this factor equals 0, but this factor never equals 0. It's an exponential function. Um, so um, when t equals uh, 0, we get 2. And then because that uh, t has a negative coefficient, it decreases um, as uh, t goes to infinity. Um, as t goes to negative infinity, it goes to positive infinity. Um, so this function is always positive. So the only way that g double prime is 0 is if this expression is 0. So we have this complicated expression involving natural log of 2. That times t plus 1 has to equal 0. If I subtract 1 from both sides, I get this. So t must equal negative 1 divided by 1 half natural log of 2 squared minus 2 natural log of 2. If you prefer to get rid of those um, fractions within a fraction, you can multiply by 2 over 2. So you'll have negative 2 divided by, if I distribute this 2 to that 1 half, I get a natural log of 2 squared. And 2 times that 2 up front is going give to us, give us a negative 4 natural log of 2 there. Um, if you want to, you could factor out a natural log of 2 from those expressions in the denominator. So you've got natural log of 2 times natural log of 2 minus 4. Uh, but it doesn't really simplify anything very much. Uh, but that is uh, what um, t would have to be to make this expression equal 0. And OK, you say, well, how do I determine whether this t value corresponds to a relative, or excuse me, to a point of inflection? It does our function have a point of inflection at this t value? I think it does, because this is just a linear function. Uh, it equals 0 at this particular t value. But the problem is I actually don't know if that coefficient is positive or negative just by looking at it. Um, well, actually, I could guess. All right, let's see. We said natural log of 2 is between 0 and 1, right? So this is a positive number. And then I've got a number that's between 0 and 1 minus 4. So that's a negative number. So I have a negative divided by a positive times a negative. Negative time, and the, the two negatives will cancel. So this will be a positive value. That doesn't help. Well, it's just telling me that my t value is positive. Well, if my t value is positive, that must mean my slope is negative, right? 
because this function is equal to zero or is equal to one when t equals zero. And then it crosses the t axis at this positive value of t. And you say that doesn't look positive, but natural log of two is positive. Natural log of two minus four is negative. A positive times a negative is a negative and a negative divided by a negative is a positive. So that means this is a positive value. And if this is positive, the, the graph must look like this. You say, okay, well, how does that help us? Well, it gives us the signs that we need of G double prime. Um, G double prime is equal to zero at that particular T value. And G double prime is two to the one minus T, which is always positive, no matter what T is, times that expression. I'm just gonna say A T plus B, where this is my A and that's my B. Say, okay, uh, to the left and right of the zero of this function, is the po function positive or negative? Well, the zero is right here. To the right of that, the y values are negative. And to the left of that uh, t value, look at the y values on that graph, that line, the y values are positive. So I don't even have to know the numerical approximation of this to know that the graph is gonna look like that roughly. And because it looks like that, um, this uh, expression is positive to the right of the zero or to the left of the zero and negative to the right of the zero. So G double prime goes from positive on this interval to negative on this interval. So the graph goes from concave up at this on, on this side to concave down on the other side. And G double prime is zero there. Since G double prime changes signs at that particular value of t, that value of t must correspond to a point of inflection. So um, g, we need to find the g value there. So we'll have negative 2 divided by natural log of 2 times natural log of 2 minus 4. And g is t squared. So we'll square the numerator, square the denominator here. So we'll have 4 divided by natural log of 2 squared times natural log of two minus four squared times two raised to the negative t power. So if I multiply this uh, by negative one, I've got two divided by natural log of two times natural log of two minus four. Now I don't think I'm gonna be able to simplify that as much as I would like, uh, but I can rewrite that two as natural log of e squared. As two is the same as uh, this because I say to myself e to what power is e squared e to the second power so if I'm trying to write this two in terms of e I say it's going to be e to that power to get the two back uh, because e to the second power is an e squared so you say okay well how does that help me well g evaluated at the t value of interest here it's going to be this number and then we've got two, um, and then raised to this power, we've got a natural log of e squared in the numerator divided by natural log of two times natural log of two minus four in the denominator. Now natural log of e squared divided by natural log of two can be rewritten um, in terms of the log base two using our change of base formula. So this is two raised to the log base two of e squared. That's that part. And then we still have that um, divided by a natural log of two minus four in the denominator. Can we simplify that at all? Well, I think we can. It's not gonna be much. Now, if you have a power raised to a power, you multiply those exponents, right? So dividing by this natural log of two minus four um, is actually the same as taking that two raised to the log base two of e squared power and raising it to the one divided by natural log of two minus four. 
say, okay, well, what is two raised to the log base two of e squared power? Since these undo each other, we just end up with an e squared. So we're going to have e squared to this power. And if we have a power raised to a power, we multiply the exponents. And I don't think I can simplify it any further than that. I could call that natural log of e squared again, but because of the minus four in the denominator, we can't simplify it. Oh, wait, we could. We actually could. Okay. <laughs> How can I rewrite that four? Well, four is natural log of e to the fourth, right? Because e to the fourth power is e to the fourth say, okay, well, how does that, how does that help us? Well, then I have natural log of two minus natural log of e to the fourth in the denominator. So that means that can be written as natural log of a, if natural log of a minus natural log of b is natural log of the quotient a divided by b. So we've got two divided by e to the fourth there. Say, okay, uh, how does that help us? Well, then this is going to be our constant, our coefficient out front. This is completely unnecessary. It's just kind of fun. <laughs> uh, in the numerator, we can call that natural log of e squared. And then we're dividing by natural log of 2 divided by e to the fourth. Oh, goodness. <laughs> now, if I use my change of base formula, I can write this in terms of the log base 2 divided by e to the fourth. But that doesn't cancel anything with this e. Um, so it doesn't actually simplify anything very much at all. Um, since it doesn't cancel anything with the E, it's probably not worth doing. I have E raised to the log base 2 divided by E to the fourth of E squared. And you say 2 divided by E to the fourth raised to what power is e squared? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure what that, po that power should be so that we get an e squared when we're done. Well, I guess we could call that two times e to the negative fourth raised to a power is e squared. I guess we could do that and say, well, how is two related to that e? Well, I guess that is, um, uh, e to the natural log of e squared, right? Because natural log of e squared would be a two. No, wait, is that what I want? No, it's natural log of two because e to the natural log of two would just give me the two back. And then because I've got two exponents with the same base, we can add the exponents. I have four minus natural log of two here, which is this similar to that uh, natural log of two minus four. Okay. I said add the exponents and I actually had, I flipped the sign for some reason. And this times what gives me a two? Well, I'll just call that uh, y. So the natural log of 2 minus 4 times y equals 2. And so y will equal 2 divided by natural log of 2 minus 4. Uh, that's actually what we had earlier. <laughs> Aw, that was a little bit of a letdown. It just sort of went, let, let us go backwards, back to that. Um, so it didn't actually simplify anything. Oh, well, um, I guess this is the simplest version. Probably should have stopped there anyway. You say, okay, well, what was that? Uh, that is the G uh, or the, the G value or the Y value at our point of inflection. Um, so the point of inflection is an XY pair. X equals negative two divided by natural log of two times natural log of two minus four. And the Y value is uh, this guy. All right, so we've got a point of inflection. Um, we've got a couple of uh, extrema. We've got an ex extreme value at zero, an extreme value at two natural log, or two divided by natural log of two. 
So with that information, uh, we can graph the function and graph those points of the point of inflection and the relative extrema and see uh, sort of what it looks like. Now we could graph that function by hand using this information if we could approximate these numbers, but I actually don't know what those numbers are. Um, so I guess we could we could type that into Desmos and try to graph the function by hand. It's always a good idea to try Desmos. I like Desmos a lot. And this is a graphing calculator, it's kind of fancy. And of course you could just use Desmos to graph the function, but we don't want to do that. <laughs> we would much prefer to graph it ourselves. Um, what did we need? We needed G of X or G of T is uh, T squared times two to the negative T power. That's kind of cool. We see we see the function itself. We say, okay, but if I didn't have my graphing calculator and I wanted to know what G was at uh, two uh, divided by natural log of two, I would type this two divided by natural log of two squared into my scientific calculator. And then I'd multiply by two raised to the negative two divided by natural log of two. And I type that all into my scientific calculator and I'd hit enter and this is what I would get. Or I could just evaluate G at two divided by natural log of two on Desmos and it gives me a, the decimal approximation as well. Um, so we know that the y value there is uh, 1.1267 uh, approximately. So now if we want to type, plot that ordered pair, my x value is 2 divided by natural log of 2, which is approximately that 2.89. And the y value is given by this. So that's our point. And then we know that g of 0 is 0. Okay, so those are two uh, points on our graph. I claim that they're relative extrema. We did all of those calculations. We said we had a minimum here at this value and a maximum here at that value. We used a scientific calculator to uh, find a decimal approximation for each of those numbers. That's what we would typically do. And then we say, okay, well, we also had that uh, point of inflection. We did all of that calculation to get a point of inflection. The uh, T value was negative two divided by natural log of two times natural log of two minus four. I claimed that was a positive value and I was right. So I'm excited about that. And then G evaluated there is, well, T squared. So we're gonna have four divided by natural log of two squared times a natural log of two minus four quantity squared. And then we did a bunch of simplification. We got an E raised to the, what was it? Two, get my paper, two divided by the natural log of two minus four. So that is our ordered pair. <laughs> That's the exact answer. And apparently those are the coordinates of that ordered pair that is hit, that exact answer. Now we were told from our calculations, we did all of this. Uh, actually, let me show you my paper. Um, we've got uh, the function is decreasing uh, from negative infinity to zero, increasing from zero to two divided by natural log of two and decreasing over here. And then the function is concave up until we get to that zero of the second derivative and concave down on the other side. So um, that zero of the second derivative is in between these the, the relative extrema. Um, so we're gonna have a point where it goes from concave up to concave down. Um, so let's graph the function now. Now we could have done that without 
um, the graphing calculator. And does that seem consistent? I think it does. We've got a min at zero, a max at that 2.89 approximately, which is two divided by the natural log of two. Um, the corresponding y value um, at that two divided by natural log of two is 1.126 uh, approximately, or 1.2 or 1.127 if we want to round. And then at this point, uh, we had all of this. This expression was our t value, which turns out to be 0 0.87 approximately. Then if we take that, we square it, and then we say two to the negative of that value. Um, and try to simplify. This is a simplified form of that answer. Um, that y value turns out to be approximately 0 0.415. Again, if I did not have Desmos, I'd be typing all of this into a scientific calculator. Usually, usually I use the a Casio. It's a uh, Casio FX 115 ES plus or something like that. It has all these numbers and I'd have no idea what FX 115 ES plus means. Um, but that does get us the graph. Um, and it was a good opportunity to practice our derivatives of a to the t. Um, the derivative of a to the x is natural log of a times a to the x. And if we've got a function inside instead, um, we've got to use the chain rule. So we use the chain rule, we use the product rule. And we took the first derivative, we took the second derivative, found out when they were zero to get critical points and possible points of inflection. And we found out where the function was decreasing, increasing, and then decreasing, and then concave upward and concave downward. And we got this beautiful graph. So I think it's pretty cool. And I think we also said, or did we say this, um, that as t approaches infinity, um, the y values approach zero. And as t goes to negative infinity, the y values go to infinity. So you got t squared times two to the negative t. Two to the negative t um, is always positive. But as t goes to infinity, two to a really large negative power is going to get very, very small. So like two to the negative one million is one divided by two to the one million. So it's a very, very uh, tiny fraction, very, very small number. But as t, t goes to negative infinity, we're gonna take that negative number and multiply it by a negative. Negative times negative is a positive. So if we plugged in negative one million for t, we'd have two to the positive one million, which would be huge. And then we multiply it by that one million squared uh, or that negative one million squared. So that's gonna be a very, very large number. Um, so the end behavior is correct, and everything looks like it, 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 the way it's supposed to look, I think. We've got, uh, we know where the graph is increasing, decreasing, concave upward and concave downward, and the end behavior is what we would expect. So, so that was a good exercise. All right, let's go back to our paper. A lot of calculations. So what were our goals again? Section 5.5, .5, we wanted to relate a to the x and e to the x. We did that using the exponential or the properties of um, that, the inverse properties of e to the x and natural log of x. So we said a to the x is the same as natural e to the natural log of a to the x because those undo each other. And then because of that, we can bring that x out front. So we can always write a to the x in terms of e to the x or in terms of e this way. We related those, we derived the change in base formula, we derived the rules for the derivatives of a to the x and log base a of x, and we um, inferred the antiderivative rule for a to the x. And then we did a few calculations. We computed some derivatives, um, and in the context of one of our problems, we did some curve sketching. Um, so, so that's pretty cool. We we're able to graph that function um, just using that new rule. I think the only uh, type of um, function we haven't really graphed yet is this uh, log base a of x. And I don't think we have any of those problems in this section. Um, it doesn't ask us to graph functions like this. Uh, but we could. We could graph functions like that um, using transformations and also derivatives if that function is more involved, if it's got something other than an x inside, or if we're multiplying or dividing by a function of x. So we might have to use the product rule or the quotient rule. Um, but we could do some curve sketching with log base a of x as well if we wanted to. But it's going to look a lot like curve sketching with and problems that are related to that natural log of x. Because log base a of x is just 1 over natural log of a, which is a constant, times log of x, natural log of x. Um, 
All right, so we did that. Uh, we did not talk about logarithmic differentiation, um, but we, we talked about that in another video. Um, and then we did do some simplifying expressions using log and exponential properties. So I think we've handled those guys and we've done some of this, but maybe in the next video, uh, we'll do a, a little bit of logarithmic uh, differentiation. We did some simplification um, just in the, the context of that um, graphing problem, um, but we'll, maybe we'll do this next time. And then perhaps we'll do something involving log base A of X with the derivatives and maybe in, um, some antiderivatives and definite integrals involving this guy. Um, and then after that, if we um, ha still have time, probably add some application problems. And I'll probably do the application problems like in a separate video for each problem. Because we use a separate video for each problem. Um, well, then we can just focus on one application at a time, which I think is a very good thing.